to see on the floor. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for being here uh, at Langkawi. And sorry for the slight delay. Uh, we were waiting for more people to arrive. Uh, so you see next to me is uh, Pak Latif, uh, kindly here to meet everybody and uh, have kindly loaned us all these fantastic Langkawi pieces. Um, it was a pleasure for me to work with him uh, in the past many months on this project. Uh, very challenging, but very rewarding as well. Um, maybe, Palat, if you want to say something, a little bit, just uh, as an introduction. Uh, okay. Uh, good afternoon. I'm sorry, I have a He very has bad, a flu, so please. Very bad flu. <laughs> I'm sorry. Maybe you'll find uh, you some other noises. Uh, well, uh, what was it? A few months ago? It was, uh, I think, last year. Like uh, last um, year. sometime mid last year. Ah, it's right there. So uh, it was very strange in a way because I have, I have never met uh, Kai. I met him first time. And uh, he's a friend of my son. And uh, when we met, somehow we just uh, talk about the. Uh, he, he told me that he wanted to. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, to to uh, to have a show, I said uh, that's a good idea, and then uh, uh, spoke quite spontaneously. I said, why not uh, we do a, a Langkawi show? And now on reflection, uh, this Langkawi never come to my mind at that time. Only that uh, I realized that uh, Langkawi uh, series uh, had not been. Um, exhibited in Singapore. So a lot of people, they don't know about Langkawi, and I thought it's a good idea to bring to Singapore so that people can see the work. And maybe they heard about them, but they have not seen it physically. And also that Langkawi uh, have been there for 40 years, exactly. And uh, so, and then I look into my collection. I have uh, what you see, the last 16, uh, really uh, the last 15 of the whole Langkawi, which actually I managed to uh, do about 90 pieces. Uh, so 90 pieces, these are the last 16 from my own collection. <laughs> the rest have been sold out. <laughs> but uh, the idea was, the, uh, to, to bring to Singapore, so I responded to Kai uh, the, the idea to have a show, and I thought this is the best uh, show uh, for this uh, occasion. Uh. Yeah, and you know, uh, this exhibition, as you might know, is part of the Disney Festival. So Disney began in uh, January this year. You might have seen the the pink pineapple outside, you know, that's part of the scene. So there's a few outdoor sculptures outside, uh, including we have artists like Richard Stratmata, we have Kamin the Chai Prasad from Thailand, we have uh, Albert Yonatan from Indonesia, uh, Nabila from Singapore but living in Australia, and then we had performances and all this. At the same time, I, as the director of the festival, I wanted also to have some a balance, you know. There's some artworks in Disney that are quite fun, you know, quite uh, uh, appealing to young people, you know, uh, the Instagram crowd, like the pineapple, like the Nanas Estate, as well, you know, uh, something more substantial like uh, the ground by Kamin Lechai Prasad. If you have seen it, it's at the corner of uh, Malan Road. It's an eight meter tall sculpture that took 18 years to make, uh, made totally out of paper. Right, it looks like a pagoda uh, sculpture structure. So I wanted also to have to have it balanced with an ex with an exhibition like this, you know, to show our range, you know, and, and appreciation of the arts. You know, it's not just uh, a festival with frivolous, you know, art or van uh, you know, art that is full of itself, vanity, you know. But I wanted to introduce something uh, like this, which is from the past 40 years, it's actually more than 40 years now. It started in 76. 
and something that is quite historical. And Fat Latif is somebody who is really, really apt because he also started his journey while he was really young as an artist here in Singapore. You know, he had his first solo exhibition at 10 years old huh? in Singapore. 1951. <laughs> yeah. 1951, a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, so it was a good homecoming, I feel, to have Langkawi. Yeah, you know, you, you, you hear a lot of Pago Pago, but Langkawi very, very rare. Uh, and recently, of course, uh, Palatif had the solo in Pompidou and also surrounding Pago Pago series, you know. So to have this... Uh, uh, it opens another window, I think, in your yeah, practice uh, for right now for the audience today. We have, a, I notice, we have also a mix of audience here. Some uh, quite mature, some very very young, who is probably yeah, not so familiar yeah, with your yeah, work. Yeah. So uh, also, I like to add that uh, beside the uh, idea of sharing the uh, Glombang, also in the case of Glombang. Uh, well, it, uh, it was done 40 years ago, uh, so uh, I like to know what the young people think about it, because the work has been, uh, you know, uh, Langkawi, I mean Langkawi. Uh, so, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, Pago Pago, in the case of Pago, Pago Pago was 50 years ago. So a lot of things been written about the day people know about it. So the idea, one of the ideas bringing to Europe really uh, to know uh, how the European, uh, the contemporary European think about uh, work that been uh, in Asia for 50 years. So what is their response? Uh, so uh, this is also one of the things I like to know the response of the uh, people, especially young people, uh, how they feel about the uh, Langkawi. So this is a good reason to have the show here. Yeah. So that was the brief that was given to me from Pat Latif when we met and when we decided to work on Langkawi. So he said that uh, I want uh, to know what the younger audience uh, feel or how they respond to something like Langkawi, as well as a younger curator. Because, you know, Pat Latif has been working with all the legendary senior curators, you know, and then I've never worked with him before. So he wanted to know my take as well as a curator yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, on the series. And if you uh, have the catalogue, the, the, I think, quite beautiful catalogue that we've made for this show, my take on it uh, and my essay in it takes on a more anthropological slant. You know, I deliberately did not talk about it in an aesthetical manner or in an art theoretical manner because many writers have done that yeah. before, you know, in other publications. So, uh, and a lot of it is my personal reading of how I see it. And I look back at Pat Latif's uh, heritage as a part of the Minang community. And uh, of course, with Minang community, you have the, this thing called the Adat Papate, which is the custom which includes an idea of uh, journeying or traveling or merantau that, that uh, is very well known and has been spoken about for Pago Pago, right? Go, Palatif going to the whole Mekong region. Uh, and I feel going to Langkawi, even though it's an island within Malaysia, it's carrying on that spirit of going somewhere, you know, to discover something. Maybe Palatif, you can talk a little bit about your heritage in relation to how it, uh, it, it fits into your thinking about art making. The uh, heritage? Yeah, like, like uh, the idea of a respect to nature and, you know. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> because, because his work, if you notice, sorry, uh, at that time when he came back from Germany to Malaysia, uh, a lot of Malaysian artists were quite nationalistic. They were all fiery, they were uh, writing poems which were very nationalistic in, in quality and Pat Latif was writing about the ants and the tree and the, you know, nature, yeah. No, it's like this. Uh, I just gave a brief uh, background uh, to what was happening in the 1970s. Uh, at that time, the Shastra literary world uh, were uh, mostly by uh, writers of the previous, uh, uh, previous the, uh, the writers of the uh, connected to the ideology of uh, art for 
society. Meaning they are, <laughs> they call perjuangan, they are the fighters of the uh, fighting, the Indonesia the fighting for, uh, uh, the independence from the uh, Dutch and here fighting for the British. Okay, but when I came in from Europe, actually, the Malaysia is already independent in 1957. So I don't see any point of uh, fighting for independence, we can independence. So the idea was for me, was to feel the independence, not to fight for independence. We have already achieved per decade. That's one. Second one, uh, most writers, they start uh, the writing from the ideology. Whereas I come from, a, you know, Things that are already uh, uh, formative or become, uh, you know. Uh, for me, is uh, writing is come from the heart. Uh, so whatever I feel uh, about something, uh, so in a way that I was alone in the midst of these people who are who are very vocal, <laughs> whereas I was timid and I was very close to nature, and I feel that. Uh, it's better for the poet, artist, to find his own voice. So that's why I'm writing about nature, about insects. <laughs> of course, at that time, they didn't understand what it's all about. Uh, that's one. Second one, of course, uh, the uh, part of uh, traveling is part of my heritage. That, uh, you know, I come from uh, Minangkaba background, where we practice uh, metrical, meaning that uh, you, uh, you like to know that uh, for a boy, when he's seven years old, he's not allowed to stay in the house. The house belongs to a woman. <laughs> so if you are staying in the house, the, uh, the boy, when he stays in the house, becomes uh, a sissy. And uh, he, he, he basically send him to away to his uncle. So his paternal uncle, he's uh, really the man who takes care of him. Uh, so, uh, meaning at a seven years old, he's out of the house and you have to follow the system of uh, what we call Marantau. Marantau is uh, going away from the home uh, to the world to seek knowledge, to seek experience and be a man. <laughs> from seven years old already, so you must be on your own. So, uh, that's what we did uh, in, my, in my generation. Uh, that uh, I I, uh, I travel I travel a lot. So uh, of course in, the, in Germany I did a lot of hitchhiking, but when I came back, uh, I decided to go north. I hit the road to Thailand a uh, few months after I arrived home, and that was '64. And this was coincidentally also the time when the Pago Pago was. Uh, you know, na nature. So I started with nature, from a leaf, from foliage, from plants, uh, meaning God made nature to uh, man made culture. Culture meanings, whatever the, uh, uh, the, the, the all the uh, craft, all these, a uh, lot of uh, images of the in Asia uh, that uh, I, I become my subject matter. I love to draw the boats, uh, the craft, all the, uh, all the traditional uh, shape and form. And so this, uh, the, the nature and the culture uh, is clustered together and become so-called uh, Pago Pago shape. Uh, that's how we come. And it can become, later on, become, after a few years, become sterilized. Mm. <laughs> that that uh, so-called, you know. So in terms of, uh, of uh, to widen the, the, uh, the, the scope of the, uh, being an artist also, I beside painting, I also do uh, sculpture, uh, as well do uh, literary work, uh, translation, uh, poetry, and all that. So a lot is happening. Uh, happening. Uh, so uh, so it, it goes on until I must say until uh, five years, until '69, where uh, so the last five years, 
I traveled to Indochina, uh, meaning Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Indonesia. And uh, mind you, it was not easy because at that time, South Asia was uh, a bit turbulent uh, politically. <laughs> uh, I had to pass through all these areas uh, in the Thailand, uh, in Cambodia, you have uh, Khmer Rouge, you know, the killing field of that. In Laos, you have Patet Lao. In Vietnam, we have Viet Cong. Uh, so, <laughs> but uh, I managed to go through and paint my way. Uh, so, this, all these are very enriching uh, for my development work. Thank you. <laughs> Talk, talking about shapes, right? Like uh, yeah. Langkawi has a very distinctive shape. Yeah. Uh, you see in this exhibition, one of the first uh, Langkawis over next to the reception table, the, yeah. that is the yeah. one rec that is rectangular. Yeah. You know, and then the rest of it is <laughs> all these uh, yeah. shapes which has been described as uh, similar to the sampan or you know very reminiscent of uh, even a rice grain and all sorts of things it's this capsule shape maybe you can uh, share with us yeah. how <laughs> the inspiration for this shape came yeah. along yeah it, it was very strange also that uh, what happened that after i did pago pago uh, when pago pago stopped 1969 uh, looking for a new idea, a new idea, new shape. Uh, I thought I was. I I, I studied painting in uh, in uh, in French and in uh, United States. So when I came back, I thought I would do become a printmaker. Mm. But that was a word failure because uh, <laughs> the, you know the the condition to be maker, you have to be very uh, uh, very disciplined and uh, you need a studio, a and all that. <laughs> it, it was a total failure. So I thought uh, I, I better go back to painting. So the first painting was uh, uh, was uh, drops of colors on the floor. And it, uh, in, in fact, it become uh, what we call later the Mindscape, the first series. Uh, that is, the, it looked more like a, a bottom part of a leaf. Uh, like a curve, like that. So I did that for some time. And then uh, the, uh, the painting coming back uh, in between. So I have in the middle, the, if you see the work there, the, the, the middle part is actually was a painting. Uh, and some of them made me of canvas. Uh, so and you have the first landscape, the leaf curve, the, the leaf, the leaf shape at the bottom, and in the uh, the top I have sort of dome, and so I connected the three shapes together and become a shape of Langkawi. Uh, now, the thing is, I like to tell you that uh, the shape uh, cannot relate to any art history. In a modern art uh, historical like. People could refer to Impressionism. You have a history, you can refer to modern traditional artwork. And Expressionism, you can throw to the German Express, to the American Expressionism. But Langkawi have no tradition. It comes from nowhere. <laughs> it comes from nowhere. I mean, uh, some, of course, Japanese would, uh, would look at it as uh, something sacred something come from the old traditional uh, temple work and things like that, uh, you know. So reference to the art development, there's none. So uh, like we see, it's exist by its own, <laughs> and it's floating, <laughs> and it's attached to the wall. Uh, that's it. So when I finished the 90 pieces uh, uh, of the Langkawi, I cannot go on. In fact, I realized that I tried to to to, uh, to do more about Langkawi later on, become more uh, structural. It's no more Langkawi. It become uh, become uh, become sculpture. You know? <laughs> so I stopped, uh, and then from there, uh, later on, uh, I decided to 
do my gestural painting, uh, which I did in the 1980s, uh, from Golombang, Rimba, and Voyage. So, uh, language stop. <laughs> it cannot go on. <laughs> and and it has its own life there. Then, then, yeah. And one of the uh, interesting facts, right, is that since the day Langkawi was exhibited in 76, it's always been referred to as wall sculptures. You know, today, when you hear this terminology, wall sculpture, is quite normal. But in 1976, in Malaysia, it wasn't. You know, it's something quite radical. And to paint also, to, to go away from using canvas to wood, and to be not just an, the artist or the sculptor, he was the carpenter. <laughs> you know, he imagine, made it imagine. himself, cut, you know, cut it himself, put them together himself, yeah. uh, and then painted them. And as you can see, the process takes, it's quite uh, intensive, you know, a lot of uh, energy to be put in one piece because uh. the colors are dropped, are dripped onto yeah. uh, the surface. Yeah. Uh, they're not like, like Pago Pago, for example, very aggressive strokes, or Gelombang, very, you know, this yeah. is very meditative, very uh, yeah, carefully. Uh, uh, what was important element is, uh, at that time, uh, I was going, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, going towards uh, minimalism. Mm. Uh, things were minimal, I meditate a lot, <laughs> uh, so I need something there, very quiet very minimal, very meditative. So you see the work are very, actually it's a meditative work. So I'm very happy that you have a lot of space around so that you can see as a, you know, you can focus on uh, <laughs> So yeah, so wood sculptures until today, these are not paintings. So when you talk about them, they are wood sculptures. And it's quite amazing that they have survived the 40 over years. Yeah, and yeah. it did not stay in one place because I mean, Pak Latif traveled or moved from house to house or from studio to studio. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, from KL, finally, it's in Penang now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the works came from uh, Penang when we uh, loaned the works. Um, Actually, this is not a very formal talk, so I can have questions in the middle <laughs> if, <laughs> if there's anybody who wants to, who has a question at the moment. Anyone? No? Okay, I'm going to look at my notes and uh, hang on, one minute. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, the technique. <laughs> When I, uh, when I said uh, minimum, meaning uh, opposite of, let's say, uh, expressionism. If you are expressionism, you have to, uh, uh, to act very aggressive. Mm. You express yourself, you know, like if you are thinking of uh, decoding. <laughs> Just gone wild on the painting and that, with a very expressive a lot of pain here and there with a brush stroke, and I tried to resist that. And so I was uh, in, uh, against the uh, emotion. <laughs> Nowadays we call it cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so uh, the, actually, I didn't touch the canvas. I, 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 I put a brush, uh, I, I, I dipped the brush, and I sort of sprinkled on with a certain distance. I'm not touching the ground. They're touching. I only the background. I did the background, but the dripping, the all that is uh, touched with a uh, <laughs> very restrained, a very little, very minimum to give the. Uh, you know, how do you restrain yourself <laughs> uh, from doing uh, from the excess, from the uh, superfluous to be you know, and this is what happened. So to keep things as minimal, and yet it get become uh, a maximum incentive of, <laughs> of uh, meditation. The, the other thing about the works, right, is uh, the appearance of, in the middle, you see this motif which reminds a lot of people of windows or doors, and, and uh, many people have asked me, 
So yeah. what about this window? So do you have a the window is actually the window or door or a so portal or something? Yeah. Uh, to give the illusion, and maybe also to give the uh, uh, what do you call the uh, 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 the uh, mythos, uh, and that is something is behind the well behind the behind the ship or Langkawi, something in the middle. Is beyond that, you have to just without the window, it still work because you can see, like, see, it's a big ocean. Mm -hmm. But when I give the window, you have a, your focal point is go beyond the painting, yeah, beyond the painting. There's something extra, so you have to discover by yourself. I cannot tell you, <laughs> you have to discover it. So you look at it, you meditate, you go right in the middle. Uh, beyond there is another world, another island, another, you know, so it goes on. Hopefully, <laughs> I don't know, the, I like to hear what you think of it. <laughs> you know? And, and, uh, and another, another thing is, out of all of uh, the series of work that Palatif has made, so we have uh, Rimba, we have Gelombang, we have Pago Pago, we have uh, Seranga. Uh -huh. This is the only body of work that is named after an actual place. Yeah. So Langkawi, so, yeah. you know. Uh, so, yeah, if you consider that the three uh, gestural work uh, very expressive, it's like <laughs> you 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 manage to uh, pass the silent part, and then <laughs> the outpouring come later. I think uh, ten to fifteen years later, I really pour out, <laughs> you know, uh, really very expressive, especially with Gulombang and all that. Yeah, so. Uh, it's something natural, I thought. Mm. But what did you decide to call it Langkawi? Langkawi? Yeah, to call oh. this series Langkawi. Well, I, I, it was in Penang, and I had a short trip to Langkawi. So I thought because of the mythos, the surrounding, the island, uh, things like that. So uh, when I came back, <laughs> so this image uh, came out. So naturally, I called it uh, Langkawi because, uh, well, you can relate to the actual island, but also there's a lot of legend about it. So, uh, and the, the trip was really magical for me. So straight away, I came back, I did the Langkawi. <laughs> uh, so it was, yeah. yeah. Sorry, we have a, a mic, so everybody can. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, my question is about what external influences have shaped your art over the years, you know, from the, uh, the abstract, the aggressiveness of the abstract work, the early work that you did in Pago Pago, and now what you have is something a lot more restrained, meditative, very tranquil. It's like the complete opposite, emotional opposite. So what caused that transition from the more aggressive style to something that is so right now, so tranquil, so serene. Sorry, I can hear. Of course, I don't want to say it now. You ask, I have to say. <laughs> you know, uh, amazing. It, at that time, I was very restless. Very restless. 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 I was young, I was, uh, but I was restless. Inside is something, you know, restless, but something is wrong. <laughs> so uh, I thought I must do something to calm down. <laughs> so I, this, uh, then I was reading also uh, a lot of high, uh, Japanese uh, talk about uh, Tao. Yeah, the, 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 that, uh, the minimalism. The Zen, <laughs> so I read about uh, Japanese uh, uh, aesthetic or ethics, uh, about the, uh, how to calm yourself. Because I saw a film uh, that was very strange. Uh, he had a lot of meditation before he pain. But this one, I'm not going to be very active. <laughs> I just want to, um, uh, how, how do you, how are you going to, uh, pain stillness, how you going to pain calmness, how you going to pain uh, something trans, uh, you know, translucent, something uh, lucid and all that. 
So you need uh, this, uh, uh, in, in, in olden days, they call it complete Tao, complete, uh, uh, what do you call, stillness. So I threw that, I threw, I threw, I did that through meditation, but how are you going to that, do that in painting? And so I thought I was restless, so I need this. Uh, this is the, uh, <laughs> what do you call, the medicine or <laughs> the, the, the therapy. So, uh, in fact, when I finish the 19, uh, 90 pieces, I feel good. <laughs> no more of that. The restless is gone. You know, in Tao, plus and minus, less is more, more is less. Yeah? I saw it work. So, I, I to answer your question, I was very restless. Something is inside me, not, you know. Uh, so, I need the, maybe sometime of you also in real life, you did. It's kind of, uh, yeah, you are very restless. You go to the beach, <laughs> to the seaside, and see the open, uh, you know, uh, ocean, uh, or you listen to good music, <laughs> things like that. So this is a kind of thing that I did. I thought uh, it was quite natural. But of course, uh, it is a big plus because I managed to carry that thing into a, uh, uh, a series of uh, work. Uh, so, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and just to add on, to give a bit of uh, historical context, uh, Langkawi was, began in 1976, and then uh, prior to that, 1974, uh, there was Pak was part of this uh, group of uh, artists in Malaysia that called themselves Anak Alam. And Ana Alam consisted of uh, writers and dramatists, you know, uh, lyricists, and all of them were very active, uh, making work that then was not canvas-based, was not object-based. They were performing, they were doing poetry and things like that. And also around that same time, in the early 70s in Malaysia, uh, there was a discourse, national discourse on what is Malaysian cultural and artistic identity. I mean, this was initiated by the government. So finally, the government decided that the Malaysian artistic identity has to be, first of all, leaning on the belief of Islam, and then traditional Malay culture, language, and things like that. And due to this, amongst the artist community, there was a lot of debate about what should be the, the, the identity. Because, I mean, Malaysia is also multiracial. Right, multicultural. So there was a lot of debate and a lot of uh, artists. Uh, at the same, uh, around that time, there was also uh, Reza Piadasa and Sulaiman Isa, right, with towards a mystical reality, which also was talking about that, talking about meditation and looking for uh, an identity that is even away from Malaysian, from being Malaysian. Yeah, but I guess Pak Latif was a hit of his time, you know, he started on his personal journey already. Uh, so there was a lot of noise in the scene <laughs> at that time, I think. And I mean, I, as an artist, I can also totally understand that you want to get away from this, yeah, you know, climber. Uh, I would say at the end of the, uh, it's you and your heart and your, your soul. Mm. <laughs> so this, I always come back to the, uh, this thing, I mean, uh, it doesn't solve this. The social or whatever is is you what you want to do with it yeah yeah you have to invent your own uh, solution your own voice and uh, with a uh, you know so this is what I did <laughs> and and also just to share with those who are not so familiar with the history of uh, Langkawi I mean not that I'm an expert on Langkawi the the island <laughs> but. Uh, Langkawi is part of the state of Kedah today in Malaysia and Kedah used to exist as part of uh, a Thai kingdom. So it was originally Langkasuka, you know, for several hundred years. Uh, and then later on it became part of the Kedah kingdom by itself uh, when it became more Malay and Islamic. And then later on when uh, it became part of Malaysia, only later on when the British started to come. And Langkawi in the 70s is not the Langkawi island that we know today. It was not a tourist destination. It was not <laughs> filled with hotels, tax-free haven. It was always been described as a backwater, you know, which was why in 86, Mahathir decided to 
turn it around, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, and do, before, do something yeah. about it. So mm. when Fight Latif went to Langkawi in the mid 70s, yeah. it's not the Langkawi we know today. So <laughs> a different Langkawi altogether. Different like that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So if you think of these histories, and also then, like uh, he said, the mythos, you know, the legends of Langkawi. I'm not sure whether you heard of the story of Masuri, for example, this uh, beautiful woman who was sentenced to death, uh, accused of adultery, and when she was stabbed to death, she bled white blood, you know, and then she cursed uh, the whole uh, seven generations of native of Langkawi will uh, not, that Langkawi will not prosper and that everyone will suffer. And yeah. two years later, Langkawi was attacked by the Siamese. And then as part of that attack, uh, one of the strategies of the locals was to cut off food supply and what they did was they burnt the granary down, the rice granary down. And until today, if you visit a part of the island, you see the burnt uh, remains of this uh, rice. It's black in color on the ground. And therefore, I think this is what gives uh, people who know a bit of history of Langkawi or the legends of Langkawi to relate the artwork to those stories as well. You know, so well. <laughs> it exists, I mean, for the people who look yeah, at them. Yeah. It's an additional yeah, kind it's of a, thing. I, I don't pretend to interpret <laughs> literally <laughs> the history of the legend. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, do we have any other questions at this point? No? Come on. <laughs> hang on, hang on for the mic. Uh, I was looking at your series of Pago Pago, Mindscape, yeah. and then yeah. Langkawi. Yeah. So I was wondering, okay, you, you have explained how you came up with Pago Pago, right? How did it develop into that Mindscape series and then you sort of like merged it into your Langkawi series, right? <laughs> In that sense. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And maybe a bit of background of your Mindscape series, if you don't mind. Yeah, I, I can tell you the, a little bit uh, how we developed. So Langkawi, uh, no, my Pago Pago, uh, the image is central. Sometimes two or three uh, central figure. Well, so basically, uh, uh, canvas and is a central the image of Pago Pago. And Pago Pago, uh, if you trim, <laughs> you trim all this uh, horn and this cluster thing, all this thing that become rounded, almost like a, 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 a yeah, top, uh, bottom, bottom part, uh, yeah, yeah. And all this structure is uh, what we call as cultural or natural thing. Uh, things are added. And you take that out, and you have a, a sort of uh, dome-like image. I mean, you clean up <laughs> the whole tree. So that's one. And second one was, uh, now I said we're talking about minimalism. You have trim all this uh, flower and fauna. <laughs> yeah, cut and become. And that's one. So, uh, as I said, Langkawi actually is between first mindscape and second mindscape. Uh, first, uh, first mindscape, uh, the first mindscape, the shape of the mindscape is the bottom part. Uh, it, it's, like, like, like the tongue of, <laughs> like, like uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and then uh, the Langkawi, uh, the, the whole Langkawi is, uh, uh, exists between the two mindscape. The second mindscape is the top part. Uh, so uh, that one is really basically is a loom with a half window in it. And it's only from that, the uh, second mindscape, that the three gestural uh, expressionist kind of gelombang develop. Correct. Yeah, it, it's like that. Yeah. It, you see like in that. the top. Yeah. Uh, so the my top Mindscape, part? there's two uh, uh, series. So Mindscape one, and then after that, it, after that Langkawi, then Mindscape two. Uh, yeah. I'm a skip two, second of my skip. My skip two is just like the ball. If you take 
I already uh, see the top, top part of the... Uh, uh. So maybe I don't... <laughs> uh, the question is why was the second mindscape necessary? <laughs> yeah, because it, uh, you have to go to... I'm going back to painting, you know? And after this, uh, two, uh, two, uh, after the... Uh, the uh, half uh, uh, half structure I have to go back to painting. So maybe there's an way of way of going back to the painting. But actually, that's what happened. Some some part of the mindscape there was uh, some gestural brushstroke, and from that uh, I, I started the the other three series. Uh, so no, so uh, that's the way I look at it. <laughs> so so meaning painting painting. And the middle is the half painting, half sculpture. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we call wall sculpture, and that is Langkawi. Uh, and Langkawi is 76 to 80, 81. Uh, yeah. And I mean, if you imagine yourself as an artist for four years at least working just in this material and this format, uh, uh, you do need the transition to uh, uh, go somewhere else, yeah, yeah. you know. Therefore, the mindscape too came about. Because I was thinking about that too, you know, you need a lot of faith, a lot of self-belief to be making work in this format for four years. Yeah. You know, when uh, prior to that, you were known <laughs> with uh, Pago Pago on yeah, canvas yeah, yeah, and everything. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a lot of, uh, you need to be really brave to do, to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I did what I like. <laughs> yeah. 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 The, so the, the, the sculpture that you did, an outdoor sculpture at Duo, uh, is it a development of this series? No, uh, no, no, uh, completely no, no, that is completely different. Sorry. Maybe you could uh, tell us a bit more about that. Uh, since that's your one of your latest works. Uh, yeah. I'm <laughs> <laughs> I also did sculpture first in. Uh, here in uh, Singapore, I did some uh, Pasir Panjang with a friend. I had some what we call a cement fondue at that time selling the shop. Uh, the cement has uh, the uh, uh, some some uh, what do you call? It? It's heavy because it has some ingredient from the I think from uh, uh, from from Basi, right? Basi. From metal. Metal, yeah. metal. So it's very good. And it has a very adhesive kind of uh, thing. So I thought I used that for small pieces uh, of the uh, Pago Pago period. I think I did few. And some uh, become uh, quite, quite tall, about five feet, with some sort of Pago Pago shape. And then, uh, you know, if you are a sculptor, you have to stay in the studio. You cannot be traveling. <laughs> So I left. I left to sculpture, and then I was doing painting, and then later I was doing, uh, doing the etching. <laughs> so it, it, I keep go, uh, you know, shifting from one uh, thing, uh, you know, back, uh, uh, more, I mop from one place, uh, one one dimension to the other. But for this uh, uh, project, it's actually. Uh, at the duo, they wanted to do. Uh, they wanted uh, me to do uh, uh, what you call uh, his commission job to do a very, very high kind of. Uh, uh, I never did a really big sculpture like that. So I, I have. I was thinking of uh, the shape of uh, Ying Yang. Ying Yang shape. Yeah. Uh, I chose Ying Yang because they were talking about Malaysia in Singapore. You must have very good relationship, the harmony. In fact, it was called harmony. <laughs> it was called harmony, Ying Yang. So I have, a, I have a, a round thing in the middle, which is uh, people told me is a very good feng shui. <laughs> and then I have a, the, the Ying and the Yang. So it's, a, it's almost like a, 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 
very, very good balancing kind of thing. So instead of left and right, I, I put it stand up vertical, and I decided to it should be metal uh, stainless steel, which I thought can last. I don't know. It is. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll live. Uh, I'll live. My, my uh, should be there and should be durable. Should be high tech. And the idea was, I think, to how 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 do you do? Uh, how do you achieve excellence? Not only just uh, the, 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 the duration of the sculpture, yeah, it can live for a while. And well. the, how to achieve the excellence of uh, the engineering part, the architectural part, and the making of it. So it was, uh, it was uh, fabricated in China, in Xi'an, China. Uh, so it took me about uh, almost one and a half years to do the whole thing. Uh, so it's done professionally. I was <laughs> quite happy with it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I supervise everything, and uh, with the help of a friend here, uh, so uh, you know, you know, all in all, came to be very, uh, come out very good. Yeah? So, uh, yeah. yeah, I think if you look at uh, Palatif's uh, CV and the exhibitions that he's done over the years, there you might notice a pause of a couple of years before the next exhibition or the next series. And in those pauses, then you see uh, sometimes a lot of activity in his writing because he is a prolific writer <laughs> and he publishes lots of books. And yeah, just yeah. in the last couple of years, he translated <laughs> Faust from German to Malay. So that's a daunting yeah, thing. Yeah. And then he's translated work of uh, Tagore before yeah, several, like several works. So Malay, yeah. it, I think the sculpture, the painting, the writing, they go, <laughs> they interweave, you know, they never yeah. were really totally separate from each other, you know, and it's always there. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh. <laughs> Can you just share a bit about your stay in, in Germany and who are the German artists that influence your work, for instance, from the uh, German expressionism and also uh, minimalism, and did you meet any famous artists like Joseph Albers? I got it. Oh, I must think back for 60 years ago. 60 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, uh, I arrived in Germany in 1960. This is about um, uh, almost a year before the war, before the war. And Berlin was like uh, just after the war, you know, <laughs> a lot of troubles and there, and they have yellow light. <laughs> so, uh, of course, it was, uh, uh, you have this cultural shock. But I was young and I went to, to uh, very hungry for knowledge, everything. So. And, I, and there was no Malaysian people don't speak English, so I had to learn by heart. I learned how to learn uh, uh, German uh, uh, drastically. Anyway, when I was in Berlin, at that time, uh, I think the German expressionism just uh, passed by, uh, just, just over, and the American expressionism just coming in. At that time, I remember there was an exhibition by uh, the um, uh, the Kuning and those uh, American expression, and they were actually uh, in the verge of changing from the pre-war to the uh, to the 1960s. And my new 1960s in in, uh, in in Europe were really the the year of happening. Then TKC was really the departure of from the that from before the war and after the war, and uh, of course if you look back to history, in the sixties were really the things happen uh, culturally, uh, politically, and all aspect. So I was arrived the same just uh, in time, uh, very exciting time in Germany, and of course uh, when you're a student, you admire certain. Painters. Uh, there was one particular painter by the name of Beckman. You remember? 
out of that one. I like him. And of course, there was some strong painters uh, from the uh, Blue Rider, the, the German expression. In fact, in fact, I met one of the uh, last uh, Blue Rider member by the name of Karl Schmidt Rotluf. He's one of the last surviving uh, member at that time. He was about 80 years old. I met him and <laughs> Uh, it was very strange. <laughs> I prepared to bend the great man, and when I come to the house, I rock the long, wrong <laughs> door <laughs> because of excitement. <laughs> anyway, so no, the problem is this: uh, when you're student, you want to be become like pin like uh, Van Gogh. <laughs> you want to be like Gauguin. And <laughs> I did try to become like the German expressionist. At the beginning, I put a raw color, yellow, you know, blue and all that in the beginning. And later, at the end, of, when I finish the painting, I become somebody else. <laughs> in fact, I become like a Mung, you know, Ed Edward Mung, the, the uh, French artist. So, uh, you, you, sometimes you start with the abstract, <laughs> and you, at the end, you become a realist. <laughs> like a realism, you know. <laughs> so uh, it, it was a lot of fun. Uh, by the end, uh, you had to find your own wash. You had to paint your own way. And so I was doing this. Uh, people are uh, influenced by the Western uh, art. But I was doing, uh, <laughs> maybe because I was nostalgic about the Eastern, I drew boats. <laughs> Uh, you know, fisherman, <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, so, uh, so, in fact, that's how the Pago Pago developed. So I, I, was, uh, I was not very keen on the Western art, although I went to a uh, museum. <laughs> I see the, the, the great masters develop. But I somehow, I prefer the Eastern uh, uh, art. So I went to the uh, uh, to the ethnic uh, museum, to the folk museum, and this way I uh, get excited. So one of the painting I did was uh, strangely enough, uh, uh, pagoda, a temple, uh, black and white. I did in '61. That was the first painting, uh, the first sketch. Uh, I have never been to Thailand. I did the Pago Pago in Berlin, 1961, three years before my trip <laughs> to Bangkok. <laughs> I said, I did it before. <laughs> no? I see our temple and all that. So, uh, did, did I answer your question now? <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite natural that you are you know, being influenced, not really influenced, uh, you admire certain artists as a student, you know? <laughs> uh, yes. Selamat petang, Pak Latif. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions, simple ones. Um, uh, what What is the first piece that you started in this Langkawi series? And amongst all the pieces, is there any piece that holds the deepest significance or like most important or your favorite piece out of all um, the pieces? From the, from the <laughs> uh, to be that one the, just next to you, that that uh, that one, <laughs> because uh, it is a bit different structurally. You have uh, the shape, uh, the more shape, more uh, dimension, and is uh, well, I like that one. <laughs> uh, and well. Uh, the first. Ah, uh, that one first. <laughs> so the one over there, that's the first uh, one, the rectangular one uh, on wood, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit uh, more complicated, but somehow I like it. Uh. And, uh, and one interesting thing uh, that you don't see here in this show, uh, and I think unless you were there at the, at the Tunku uh, Chancellor, oh, is the big, the big piece. Uh, ah. It was what, four meters, five meters? 
the one that you put on the roof. Ah. On the, so Palatif made one piece of langka which, which is about four, <laughs> four meters plus. No, it it was on the roof of the gallery. Uh, uh, you know, but it's, it's yeah. since been destroyed. Maybe you can yeah, talk a bit. Yeah, it's a structure, three by seven feet. is hanging on the wall. My first ceiling sculpture, <laughs> just for the entrance. Uh, it's lost. I don't know where. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we wanted to recreate that sculpture, uh, but you yeah. know the means, the energy <laughs> is a bit challenging. Yeah, but there there was uh, one, and there's a couple of uh, photos of it. But yeah. uh, we yeah. have it. <laughs> it's uh, not often seen in publications. Uh, no, it's no, quite no. obscure piece, yeah. and it's disappeared already. Yeah. So it's nowhere. Um, any more questions? Good afternoon, Pak Latif. Salamat yeah. Haraya. <laughs> um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is, um, I'm curious to hear about your trip to Langkawi and why it was so magical for you. Um, and then the second one is, in term, you talked about how like a writer and artist, um, it ultimately comes back to your own heart and your own soul. So I was wondering whether looking at these works now that you created in the 70s, whether or not you feel like it still resonates with the language of your heart now. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, now, what I mean by magical is just uh, when I had this trip to Langkawi. Uh, uh, maybe it was the atmosphere. The, the, I'm, I'm not talking about the legend and uh, myth, myth also that, but the atmosphere of the Lanka at that time. Uh, 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 I was right. At that time, was uh, Lanka was tempat uh, <laughs> bunian. Oh, it's uh, known as the realm of the other. It's like the, the, the other creatures, non-human. Uh, it's a ghost town. It's mystic, it's a, mythical, very slow, mystical. nothing happened. You know, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no port, there's no ship, nothing. And uh, you have to wait for the boat. And there's no shop, nothing. It's just a small fishing, fishing village when I came in at that time. So, uh, of course, the, the, the legend also uh, comes to your mind. And you know, you look at hill differently because the legend and the mythos. <laughs> it's just a, it's just a, just a, just a normal hill. But you look at it, you know. And it was evening. And it was all dark, <laughs> and you have this thing coming out. So somehow, uh, out of ordinary, that's what I mean by magical. It has nothing to do with magic. <laughs> it's just uh, the feeling. Oh, the feeling of it, yeah, yeah. And Langkawi is, uh, if I'm not wrong, is 99 islands. That is what made, makes uh, Langkawi. It's not one uh, island, it's 99 uh, yeah, yeah, islands. Yeah. 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 So yeah. her second question is, uh, when, you, when you made this, you said it's for your personal, it's uh, your heart and soul. Do you think uh, you uh, Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't want to say yeah, this Langkawi is difficult because uh, I don't know how to explain to the people. It's not a painting, it's not a sculpture, it had no tradition. You know, there's something very personal. So uh, it's difficult to... But yet, uh, as a creator, as a painter, I like to do something different, of course. But, uh, I mean, you have no idea you're going to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, so it's very, very personal. I must say that uh, Langkawi is uh, most people a bit <laughs> incoherent. <laughs> they say, what is this? Is this a painting? Is it a, a sculpture? And what you call it, wall sculpture? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it is something new to the Malaysian art scene. But then again, what I mean by my heart is the artist have to attend to respond to his own uh, what you call heartbeat, <laughs> whatever you want to do it, you just do. Uh, explanation later. You don't explain thing what you want to do. 
I don't know. You just do it, and people ask, you explain. <laughs> and the most you can, I mean, you cannot explain everything. Huh? <laughs> Any more questions? Uh, no? Yeah. Okay. This is not a question. I just want oh. to say hello to Lucky. Ah, hello, hello. <laughs> we met at Brunei. <laughs> okay, there's one hello. question there. Okay. Hello. Um, I just wanted to find out about what you were saying earlier about how it was important for you to drip the paint as opposed to brushing um, the colors on. And I was wondering, in terms of is that something that was important to you from maybe subconsciously a historical, you know, ex experimentation uh, place? Or what was the significance of it being dripped on? I mean, this is getting a little more talking about your process, but I'm just wondering what was the significance of it being dripped? Um, was that something that was very, very relevant to you at the time? Oh, the, the, the technique. Technical part, yeah. Uh, <laughs> why I did the dripping technique rather than paint on it? Is that is that is that? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of things happening. Uh, when you when you drip uh, the paint, uh, you really you have to be uh, in control. Uh, there is, of course, an element of chance. You take the risk of chance that maybe uh, the first, uh, second brush stroke, uh, <laughs> sort of a lot of flag, lot of, uh, uh, there's a uh, lump of paint on it, you know, which is, this, this, is what, this is not what you want. So there's a lot of preparation, mind you. I have to choose uh, uh, the, the color. Uh, first of all, what was the first color? Uh, second layer, third layer, first one. And I was working in four, uh, four methods. I have a wet pen, uh, the, the ground wet, and I have a dry uh, uh, pen to sprinkle on it. What's first? Second, I have a dry pen as a base, and I have a wet pen on it. And wet on dry, dry on wet, wet on wet, dry on dry. There's four, four techniques there. And now as to why I don't paint, because I like to, to know the effect of the sprinkle, the dripping or things like that. And that one is actually, I must tell you, uh, most of the work, in fact, half of it, I did disregard. It didn't work. Either by accident, I dropped something on it. <laughs> I have to paint all over again. And so it's a very strenuous sense that uh, you have to be really in control. Huh? And of course so, you have to work on the yeah, floor, yeah. No? not so on the easel. So. One is you feel very strongly uh, what, what you want to paint. And then when you do it, something happens accidentally. You know, this is also taken into account. But after a few, uh, few work, maybe about a dozen, then it, you really know. If you do this, they felt like this. If you do this, they felt like this, you know? So after some time, it's just quite natural. Wet and wet, dry, no problem. <laughs> dry and dry, no problem. So it goes on from each uh, painting to another. And so this, this experience, I never had this before. And not in painting. Painting, we just uh, paint, small brush, big brush, you know? <laughs> Take wet and wet and dry. But this one is something different, which also is not like I'm not a scientist, <laughs> but I feel that something is working there, you know, and there's uh, something strange. And this one, that, that's the thing that kept me going. Uh, <laughs> say, my friends say, what are you doing? <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, uh, it's, uh, meaning I, uh, it's very straining. Uh, I'm against the grain, first of all. <laughs> Very, very strenuous work. When people say, strain yourself, uh, what do you mean? How do you strain oneself from uh, doing, uh, doing it too much, 
access over. Uh, how do you do this? I didn't know until I <laughs> practice uh, in a Lanka winner and how to restrain yourself, how to re restrain yourself when doing the painting. Yeah? Uh, in in uh, normal life, you say you restrain yourself from talking, you just <laughs> get fired. <laughs> no. But I do that in painting. So, so thank you. I learn a lot from this. Uh, uh, doing the doing, people don't know. But I I I, I learn a lot from the uh, from the practice uh, or the, from the very actual art, uh, the the, uh, the process. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. One last last question before we close. No? Last one? Okay. So, <laughs> thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's been quite an enlightening session. I mean, it's a casual chat with uh, Pat Latif. And uh, the show will be on until 22nd of July uh, here. Uh, we have uh, the catalogs published by the gallery. It's, we decided today to sell it for a special price for you. If you buy two, you buy it at $50. If you buy one, it's $30. Uh, the design has been approved by Pat Latif. He likes it very much. And you can get his autograph today if you buy it now. <laughs> because he's going to leave soon. He's not going to hang around. He's not so well today. So he's probably going to stay 